Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. There's Jerry. This is Stuff You Should Know. Action edition. <laughs> I got a laugh out of Jerry, at least. Hi, giggle. I got a, a, a derisive snort. How about that? That's what it was. <laughs> How you doing? I'm great. Well, I'm concerned about the earth. You're concerned about the earth? Yes. More than usual? Yes. Because of this podcast? Yes. Okay. Yeah, man. So, before we get started... You've heard of the Anthropocene, right? Uh, I know you have. You definitely have. We've certainly mentioned it before on the episode or on the podcast. So there's this debate right now over whether we've entered a new geological age. Oh, right. From uh, the one to the Anthropocene. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, I, I really wish I could remember what the, the current one is because people are going to write in and be like, it's this. Yeah. A million times over, which thank you, everybody, for writing out. I don't mean to sound ungrateful. Um, but the, the idea is that <clears throat> we've entered this period. Some people place it starting at the Industrial Revolution. A lot of people place it more at 1950 when there was apparently a huge spike in the presence of humanity from radioactivity, plastics, all this stuff in the environment as a whole to where our presence has so muddied the geological record that we've effectively come up with a new age, a new geological age, the Anthropocene, the age of, of humans. Right. So one of the things, one of the, the factors that people point to that suggests that we're, we're changing the, the natural geological record. We're leaving the Holocene. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> sure. So, um, the, the idea that we, we are altering what the natural course of the Holocene or the course it would have taken had humans never been around. One of the ways we're doing that is by shuffling species from one environment to another, from one ecosystem to another where yeah. they've never been before, probably never would have ended up, at least not in any of our lifetimes. Um, and that they are altering those ecosystems in radical new ways such that when those things fossilize, those ecosystems become fossilized and can be studied, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of years hence, archaeologists would be pretty puzzled by what they were finding. Yeah. And that's the basis of the idea that we should be calling this the Anthropocene. Wow. Now I'm scared. That was my goal. <laughs> well done. Thank you. All right. So what we're talking about is invasive species. Um, and I'm surprised we hadn't done this one. I was too. I went back and double checked. And Me I don't, too. I don't think we did. I'm, I don't. And I remembered what episode. I remember it was the Beagle Brigade. Oh. We talked a lot about invasive species in the Beagle Brigade. Episode. That's right. And we may have even said we should do one on that. So, If so. Wish fulfilled. <laughs> uh, so what we're talking about is invasive species. This is um, this can be any type of it, – it's not necessarily a plant or just an animal. It could be seeds. It could mm -hmm. be eggs. It could be – it can even be a disease, right, or a fungus. Sure. Yeah, a pathogen, a pest, a, a predator, a, a plant. Just It could be anything. Yeah, any kind of, any kind of living organism that's not native – to uh, a singular or a particular ecosystem. Right. But, and the How Stuff Works article kind of leaves it at that, but the um, National uh, Wildlife Federation article that you found, mm -hmm. I think really kind of drives home that there's like an extra couple factors involved, right? <clears throat> yeah. Because you can have a non-native species that we actually kind of like, like European honeybees. They're a non-native species yeah. here in the United States, but we're crazy for the pollinating they do. It doesn't always wreck honey. things. Right. And the honey that they make. Rice is not a native um, uh, crop here in the United States, Good but point. people people love rice. So there are just being non-native isn't enough. It has to actually harm 
the ecosystem that it's not native to and has been introduced to in some way, shape, or form. So it's it's a non-native species that's causing harm either directly or indirectly or both to this new ecosystem it's it's been introduced to. That's an invasive species. Right. And it's not just – do we grow rice in the United States? Sure. Okay. Uh and it doesn't have to be from another country. It can, like we said, it's an ecosystem. So it could be something from one area of the United States mm-hmm. to another area of the United States. Right. Or from Mexico to the United States. Right. Like trout from the Great Lakes, that's their natural habitat, so they're fine. But you take that same trout and put it in, I think the example given was the Yellowstone River, and they're now competing for habitat and food with the local trout. That's an invasive species. Right. They come in all shapes and sizes, as our very own article says. Uh, There are different names for them. God loves them all. (laughs) Uh, Like some people might say exotic pests or uh, non-indigenous species, alien species, stuff like that. But invasive species is kind of – I think that's the go-to these days. Sure. That's the one you you hear starting in the 90s. Actually, that's – it's funny. Like all of the – eco stuff that we know about from recycling to invasive species it all was like born in the 90s you know what i mean yeah bill clinton uh i think he well, i don't think he invented that name but he went uh i Do think it. he gave it gave him he gave, he gave it the stamp what did he say though i think he said nailed it <laughs> <laughs> yeah he could have been talking about any number of things or people right there <laughs> <laughs> but in that case, he was talking specifically about Executive Order 13112, where the term invasive species was first defined by the United States government. And the reason that they did this, this is 1998, the reason that they were defining invasive species is because around about that time, the the world was really waking up to the fact that if you take a species of plant, animal, bacteria, pathogen, whatever – And you put it into a place, a new ecosystem where it has no predators. It's going to create havoc for the, 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 the ecosystem as it was before. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of one of the keys here is that, um, generally they will cause a lot of harm, maybe to the environment, maybe to the economy, maybe to people, maybe one, two or all three of those. Uh, and another key aspect of the invasive species is that, it's pretty hard, if not impossible, sometimes to contain and eradicate. Yeah, I think I get this impression from researching this, Chuck, that like the the second wave of waking up to invasive species, realizing like they're never going to late. go away now. They're done. It's done. Like the first wave, <laughs> you don't notice it's already happening. Right. Yeah. By the time we do notice, it's too late. And then now we're realizing like, oh, OK, well, we can we can handle this. It might be tough. And now I think we're finding no, we like it will know it, you can handle it you just can't eradicate them one right. of the big problems is, is like if you if you say develop a poison that kills some you know non some invasive fish that was introduced right say carp um you're going to kill the other fish in the area too or some of the other sea life or something like that so there there's just not really any way you can target these things short of shooting each one of them and you're going to shoot a plant? <laughs> They'll think you're crazy. They'll lock you up for that. So don't even try it. And here's the deal. is This this is not a new uh, phenomenon. This Nature has been doing this for years on its own in various ways, uh, whether it's uh, leaping over the, the Tasman Sea from Australia to New Zealand right? Uh, or over a, a, a channel of water like – or over a mountain range. It happens. But generally – <clears throat> bodies of water and mountain ranges and deserts and all these other geological features help to stop this stuff. It's really humans that are doing most of this, uh, not necessarily on purpose, but sometimes on purpose. Yes. Yeah, um, as we will see, but sometimes it's just like it's in the ballast water of a ship or it's in, uh, there's an insect in the, the wood of, uh, or it's in packing material. It's in the wood of the, uh, what are those things called? The crates, the pallets? Yeah, pallets, uh, shipping pallets. And all of a sudden, it leaps out on the other side of the world, and (laughs) you have an issue to the tune of uh, 50,000 estimated 
non-native species in the United States alone. Yeah, I was looking that up. That's a pretty, that's one of those things we always like give, um, you know, evidence or not evidence, um, advice. Yeah. Like, uh, if you see something all over the place, like double check it, you know? Right. Is that, that not was, a real number? No, I think it is a real number. It's from 1999. Hmm. So there's no telling. It's, we're probably at 50,000 and like 500 now. But it was from a guy named uh, Pimentel, who is a uh, world famous ecologist. Penn and Teller? No, Pimentel. Oh, okay. And he's from Cornell. I don't know if he's still at Cornell, but <clears throat> the the thing that this leaves out though, it's fifty thousand non native species. But that same study from ninety nine found that um, about forty three hundred of them could be considered invasive. Okay, that that's what I was wondering. The other ones are like the honeybee, where we're like sweet. Sure, or rice. Right. Don't don't forget <laughs> rice. Uh, and like I said, sometimes in the water of a ship's hull, sometimes uh, in this wood, and sometimes on purpose, like we said, like when the Burmese python found its way to Florida. Dude. That was no accident. Were you? Have you looked up Burmese python Everglades recently? <laughs> yes. Dude, they get so big down there. And did you see the one that had burst itself to death eating an alligator? Well, no, but I did see the... Uh, alligator and the python fighting on a golf course. That's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. That makes me glad to be alive to see something like that, you know? Well, here's the deal. While we're on that, um, earlier that, well, all right, more than 2,000 of these pythons have been removed. 2,000 have been removed since 2002 when it was just, I guess, uh, recreational activity. But starting in March of last year, 2017, mm-hmm. Florida started sanctioning python hunters. And a 1,000 dudes applied. They accepted 25, said hmm. we'll pay you minimum wage. <laughs> we'll literally pay you 8 bucks an hour, or I think that was the minimum wage at the time, to hunt pythons. And they're all like, done. <laughs> right. And they started hunting pythons. They've caught 743 since March of 2017. And uh, earlier this year, or I'm sorry, uh, late last year in December, the dude, uh, Jason Leon, did you see that one that he caught? No. I may have seen a picture feet. of it. Wow. 17 feet long, 133-pound Burmese python. Jeez. Uh, and the reason why these are a big deal, just, you know, aside from just sheer terror, uh, <laughs> is they're eating furry creatures, a lot of them. I saw that some populations down in the Everglades of um, types of deer, rabbits, um, a lot of creatures that you know and love have gone down by up to 99% in some areas yeah, they of did, the Everglades um, because of the, the python. University of Florida, and I won't say what everyone wants me to say. Good for you, man. <laughs> yeah, that's like, how, how can you be, you know, possibly the national champs and and throw shade at anybody below you, you know? <laughs> so the University of Florida in Gainesville did a project. They released – and this makes me so sad. They released 95 rabbits uh, into the Everglades, and they – these were all tracked. And it's not like when these rabbits didn't turn up a year later and they're like, we can't find them. I guess snakes ate them. They, <laughs> they know that snakes ate them. So Snakes did? A, a year later, 77 percent of these rabbits were eaten and dead. Uh, from these pythons. Wow. So it's a problem. That is a sad study. It is. Can you imagine, like, opening that those crates and being like, all right, go you be go, free. <laughs> go live your new life. It's an adventure. <laughs> oh, man. It's so sad. So that's just one example of the most horrific. Uh, and that's not one that's, like, costing a, a $200 billion in damage a year. But that is an estimate from a professor at Cornell. That's the same one, Pimentel. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, that's the estimate from him that it's costing the United States between 100 and $200 billion a year in damage yeah. from all these uh, invasive species problems. Yeah. That's a lot of dough. It really is. And the, the Burmese python is, is a good example also of people just releasing like a pet that you don't want anymore. That's probably how they were oh, yeah. established. That's absolutely how it was established. There's other, there's another, uh, there's a lizard called the tegu 
which is a big problem in all of Florida apparently as well. Oh, yeah. Um, they're just a huge lizard that were originally pets and were released and now they've established a feral population in Florida and they apparently will eat your cat. They've been known to do that. They'll, um, storm your house. They'll come into your house. Yeah. It's just a bad jam, right? There's also the Nutria swamp rats, which were originally grown for their fur in, in the, in Louisiana. So they, they use rat fur apparently in Louisiana of course to keep do. warm. Yeah. And, um, that when the rat fur industry went under in the thirties, I think <laughs> they released these things into the swamps. And then last, most recently, feral hogs were imported so that they could um, hunt them. And yeah. there's a huge population that's wrecking their the ecosystems they've been introduced to. So a lot of times people? humans are lunkheads when it comes to shuffling animals into ecosystems where they're, they're not native. That snake's too big. Put it behind the house. <laughs> right. Let her Let's, loose. Right. Then let a bunch of rabbits loose and see what happens. We'll see who wins. Snake wins. Snake wins. Should we take a break? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, man. Well, actually, quickly before we take a break. What? uh, I talked about how much it was costing the U.S. Department of Interior spending about a hundred million bucks or more a year uh, trying to fight this in various ways. All to very little success. Yeah. All right. So now with that stat, we will, uh, we will take a break. So, Chuck, we talked about people releasing um, animals purposefully, mm-hmm. and you mentioned some other ways. But one of the things that, that gets me is ballast water. Like, how is yeah. this allowed to go on where a ship will take on water to balance out its cargo load? Because, you know, it, different cargo is going to weigh different. It's going to be laid out differently. So you need new ballast every time mm-hmm. to to balance it out. Which makes sense, but surely there can be some other technology because you're, you're like in Eastern Europe picking up a bunch of water to balance your, your ship out. I know. And that, that cargo is bound for Detroit. So you enter the Great Lakes and you're like, Oh, well, water's water. I'll just release it here yeah. once I unload my cargo and whatever animals you picked up in Eastern Europe now live in the Great Lakes. And this actually happened with the zebra mussel. Which is a huge, huge problem in the Great Lakes now. Yeah, the zebra mussel and the quagga mussel. Yeah. Uh, which apparently are almost the same thing, uh, and how they act. They're from Eastern Europe and they're small. And that's exactly how they ended up in the Great Lakes, like you said. And they, boy, talk about spreading. Are there like, how many are these? Like a trillion? A trillion. At least. Isn't that and the crazy? Reason, the reason why is like a, a quagga will live or a quagga or a zebra mussel will live about five years. And the female in that time will produce five million eggs. There's 10 trillion of them. A hundred. That's so many mussels. A hundred thousand of those that of those eggs will reach adulthood. And so the offspring of one single mussel will produce about half a billion adult offspring. So, yeah, 10 trillion is a pretty reasonable number. And they just entered the Great Lakes in the, I think, the 1980s. Yeah. So just within, what, 40 years? Gosh, can you believe the 80s were like 40 years ago or coming up on it? Mm, um, I can. <laughs> it doesn't seem that long ago to me, but, man, that's crazy. Well, and the problem with these is, you're like, oh, Wait, what's... wait, I'm reminiscing still. <laughs> All right, I'm done. The problem with these is, like, big deal. They're these tiny little mussels. But they are blanketing the bottom of the Great Lakes, uh, and they're eating plankton because they love to eat plankton, which <clears> makes <throat> the water nice and clear. Everyone's like, look how uh, shimmery Lake Michigan is. Have you seen pictures of Lake Michigan recently? No. It looks like the Caribbean. Really? White sand, beautiful see-through, like, turquoise water. Wow. That's it's, not good, people. 
gorgeous. No, it looks really amazing, but ultimately, no, it's not healthy because, like you were saying, they eat all the plankton that's supposed to be on top and on the bottom, too, and the um, the sunlight can penetrate all the way to the bottom, causing algae blooms. Right. Deadly algae blooms. <clears throat> I, I just just happened to run across an article yesterday, Chuck, and I understood why I was seeing what I was seeing. But the article was about how the Lake Michigan has become so clear that you can see shipwrecks on the bottom of the lake That's from the air if you're flying over it. You I can clearly see shipwrecks. Yeah. And the reason why is because the the zebra mussels have doubled the clarity of the water since the 1980s. Well, and not only is it just the plankton, but they're eating – uh, the plankton is, is causing, uh, salmon to go hungry, whitefish. Um, so if you, you know, it's just, it's wrecking the ecosystem down there. Right. Thank you, and Eastern that, Europe. That's a, uh, well, thank you, ship captain who took on that water as ballast. Um, another ballast story I ran across too was, um, uh, fire ants, the worst thing in humanity, right? <laughs> that's pretty bad. Fire ants are um, native to South America, and they think that they stowed away on dirt that was scooped up as ship's ballast and released in New Orleans. Really? Yeah, in like the 30s or 40s. But that's where the fire ants came from. They shouldn't be here. Didn't that make them even worse? Yeah. hate those things. So um, here's another one. You want to talk about the Asian carp? Sure. So in the 1970s, in I think like in Arkansas, there were some uh, some farmers, fish farmers, that is, mm-hmm. who said, uh, "Let's get some of these Asian carp in here to filter the water," <laughs> and they did. It sounded identical to what the researchers from University of Florida sounded like in my head. Right, and they all sounded like Bill Clinton. Right, uh, who was from Arkansas, right? Yeah. Uh, Full circle. So uh, Asian carp were introduced. Uh, I guess they did a pretty good job of filtering the pond water, but then they started spreading. And that's the deal is, it, is you know, like with the uh, the zebra mussel, you know, they get in these waterways like in Chicago, these man-made waterways that, that said basically like expressways mm-hmm. or they get in uh, the Mississippi River and it just – it's like, all right, here, here we go, rest of the country. <laughs> Let's do this. Uh, yeah. And so Asian carp – uh, it's a it's sort of a catch-all name for a bunch of species of carp from Southeast Asia. But here's their problem: is they're very dense. They consume about 20 percent of their body weight each day in plankton. They can be as big as a hundred pounds, which is very large for a for a fish. Right. If you haven't noticed. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they're all over the place now. They went up the Illinois River. Uh, they are almost, or maybe even are invading the Great Lakes now, as if they didn't have enough problems. And they're another one. They lay about a half a million eggs each time they spawn. Right. And they eat a lot of plankton. And there's this guy, um, that they're a good example because they're, they're so thoroughly crowd out, um, the rest of the ecosystem, or the rest of the animals in the ecosystem that it actually, like, kind of wrecks the whole ecosystem. Yeah. They're they're an example of like a um, grade three or level three, I think you'd call it level level three invasive species, right? right. There's this dude. He was he is a um, marine biologist, and I don't know if you can tell or not, but I'm stalling while I look for his <laughs> name. I can see it. Is it coming across everybody? Yes. Um, so I cannot find the dude's name. I don't. Have anyway. It. You don't have it either? No. Well, he came up with Let's these. Let's call him Dr. Zhivago. Okay. Dr. V- Dr. Zhivago came up with these basically four levels of, of impact that an invasive species can have on biodiversity in an ecosystem. And the first level is basically like they're just a new species. They're not doing anything. You could even make a case that it's, it's a good thing that they're there now because they've sure. improved or increased the biodiversity of the habitat. Right. right. <clears throat> So level one is they're just there. Nothing bad has happened yet. Level two is when they start to have a um, an effect on the on the ecosystem in some very specific way. Right. And Dr. Zhivago gives this really great example of the <laughs> Eastern North American gray squirrel, which was inexplicably introduced in 1876 to England. 
And since then, it has basically outcompeted the native red squirrel there. Um, but it's just the native red squirrel that's been affected. The rest of the ecosystem is basically the same as if the North American squirrel had never showed up. Yeah. It's just the red squirrel who are trying to go around and tell everybody, like, doesn't it suck that North American squirrels are here? Everybody's like, well, it's fine with me. I don't care. And the red squirrel just can't get any kind of ally in this. That's level two. Okay. Shall I continue? Please. Level three is where the species becomes so dominant, spreads so fast, so wide, reproduces so quickly and so massively that they, they begin to impact the entire ecosystem as a whole. Right. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then the fourth level is where they have upset the ecosystem that they are not native to but have established themselves in so thoroughly that it now impacts other ecosystems either nearby or that are somehow connected to that ecosystem and then level five is when you wake up <laughs> covered in a hundred squirrels <laughs> right <laughs> all just quietly <laughs> staring at you can you imagine no you ever seen those black squirrels in brooklyn yes i've seen them in like toronto usually or dc i love those things yeah they're pretty cool i'd love they're, to get some they're of those tough in guys too yeah they'll like yeah they'll they'll like They'll charge you. Yeah, they, they don't take any guff. No. But see, if you brought some to Georgia, it could be bad for the squirrels here yeah. because it's a non-native species, even though it's in the same country. Yeah, but, man, we got so many squirrels in Atlanta. I wouldn't mind seeing a few of those go, and I love all furry things. Well, you know how I feel about squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why it's going to haunt your dreams, waking up being covered by a 100 squirrels. Yeah, It'd be more, it'd be worse if I had a dream where a hundred squirrels covered my bird feeder. That's worse to me. I'd yeah. rather them cover me. Cover <laughs> me instead. Leave my bird feeder alone. They would be so happy to chow down on you, though. Their little tails would be all flitty. <laughs> they would they'd be so excited. They'd say, this is a long time coming, Josh. They'd store some of you for the winter <laughs> in their haunches. But then they'd forget, except for about a third of me, where they put it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Stupid squirrels. Uh, so those are the four levels. We were kidding about the fifth. Mm-hmm. And I feel bad for Dr. Shivago because what if that dude listens and he's like, oh, they're going to say my name. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Shivago. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he's going to start going by that. <laughs> maybe so. We you just know? changed that dude's life. All right. So uh, we talked a little bit about how some of these can affect things like eating plankton. Um, what, what are some of the other uh, deleterious effects. Deleterious? <laughs> so there's, well, I mean, there, you can basically categorize the effects that these things have in two categories. There's direct and indirect ones, right? Okay. So direct would be like if you, like, let's say those Asian carp eat um, the eggs of the other fish it's competing with. Right. That would be a direct impact. That would make the other fish very unhappy, right? Yes. Um, they could also be a bug that carries a disease that kills trees. Like um, the, I can't remember what bug carries like Dutch elm disease, but there's there's bugs that carry diseases that kill trees. That's directly impacting the trees in that ecosystem. Yeah. Then there's like indirect ones too, right? So like – Let's say you have like a grass that grows really well in its new habitat, a yeah. non-native grass, so much so that it outcompetes the other grasses. Well, this new grass is really good at growing in this ecosystem, but it's terrible as far as like nutrient density is concerned. Yeah. And it's choked the, the rest of the grasses out, which means that the sweet little deer and the rabbits that are about to be eaten by snakes don't have those grasses to eat anymore, and they can't eat the new grass. That's an indirect impact. So suddenly the populations of these higher animals are going to thin out, either because they're going to die off, they don't reproduce as fast, or they just move. Um, so that's an indirect impact of, of an ecosystem. Or like that cocon grass. Uh-huh. Which is the one here in the southeast. It's an Asian plant. Like that one does the, the one thing you're talking about, no food value for the wildlife, mm-hmm. but it also, uh, burns really hot and fast, more so than native grasses. So it's like, it has this, uh, dormant, uh, danger of being, uh, a wildfire hazard. Right. Yeah. It's, I saw another one called cheatweed has the same thing and it's, it's altered the wildfire cycle. 
I think in the Southwest where it's growing from like um, 50 to 70 years to something like three to five years now. Yeah. They have like massive wildfires. And it's because it burns so fast and it's so dense. It's just such a great fuel that, um, that yeah. There's an, there's another way that they can indirectly affect an ecosystem too. Um, a lot of plants that are non-native come in and alter the composition of the soil. They either oh, yeah. change the amount of nutrients that yeah. are available. They change the pH. They just alter the soil chemistry. And I mean, like the soil, that's like the building block of an ecosystem. You start altering that, everything from the soil up is affected and impacted in some way or another. Well, and then that soil can then be transported to another ecosystem, you know? Right. Yeah. Which is how the stuff spreads. Yeah, that's actually one of the tips for something you can do is not move soil very long, far distances uh, that can cut down on invasive species transfer, too. All right. Well, let's take another break, and then we will talk a little bit about uh, the two ways to try and manage this. A little and bit. some more. Yes, and what you can do and the story of kudzu, which is probably not quite what you think. All right. So as far as management, um, there are a couple of main ways that we're trying to control invasive species, uh, proactive management and reactive. Um, proactive, if you go to California and you have to stop at the California border and they say, do you have any fruits or vegetables from outside the state? Mm-hmm. That would be an example of proactive management um, is trying to keep it from happening to begin with by not allowing – stuff in that shouldn't be in. Yeah, I, I guess apparently in this How Stuff Works article, the author talks about how they quarantine firewood sale up in Connecticut to yeah. keep emerald ash borers from making their way through the state. Isn't that crazy? Um, or Guam. Guam has this huge brown tree snake problem. We must have <laughs> talked about this in the in the Beagle Brigade, <clears throat> but they've like basically killed off the population of every other animal on the island. It's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's not too far off. They've really had a huge impact on it. And they, um, they, they train dogs to, to sniff them off the case from any cargo plane or ship that leaves Guam has to be inspected by these things, by these dogs to find the snakes because they, they are taking it that seriously because they've had such a terrible impact on Guam. Wow. Uh, proactive management, another thing that they do. Aside from like border inspections and stuff like that, is basically just trying to destroy it. In, I guess in that first uh, phase, Doctor Zhivago's first phase. By the way, Doctor Zhivago's name oh. is. I found it. Are you ready for this? I think we should get a drum roll, Jerry. Doctor Alexander Mienzes. M E I N E S Z. Marine biologist. But he says you can call me Al. Or just call me Dr. Z. Like Paul Simon. Yeah, sure. Um, all right. So, yeah, eradicating them in the early stages. Uh, and this has happened before uh, in California specifically. They uh, beat down an invasive weed uh, brought in from the tropics. So it can work. But I get the feeling that in researching this stuff, like once you're past that first stage, you may be SOL. Well, it, yeah, I have that same And you just cross too. your fingers that it's not one that will wreck the ecosystem. So that's proactive. There's also reactive management too, yes. right? And there's the age-old, well, just get your hands on whatever its natural predator is and then introduce that into the <laughs> ecosystem. Yeah. Or the, that's for like uh, from that classic Simpsons episode. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that where Bart <laughs> – has a tree lizard that eats birds, so they release some tree snakes, and then they release some gorillas <laughs> to eat the tree snakes. And they say that a cold snap will cause all the gorillas to freeze to death, so that'll be that. <laughs> that's like that's basically what they're what they're doing. Like there's this this um, bug called brown marmorated stink bugs, which are actually 
they, they're stink bugs and they'll swarm in your house. So they're a pest, but they're also really bad for fruit crops and, and vegetable crops. Um, and they don't have a natural predator here over in Asia where they're from. They are uh, predated by a, um, parasitic wasp. So they're thinking of bringing parasitic wasps over. And it's like, oh, yeah, sure, nothing could go wrong if you bring <laughs> parasitic wasps into an ecosystem. Man, those stink bugs, they uh, will scare the bejesus out of you in the middle of the night. Yeah, because they'll swarm. Well, I mean, I've, I've never seen more than one at a time. Oh, yeah? But I'm just talking about waking up because one of them is crawling over your cheek. Well, supposedly the brown marmorated stink bugs are different from the southern stink bugs that we're used to. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, and they, they look the same. swarm. No, yeah. well, I can't tell the difference. I've never smelled any stink either. I haven't either. I saw somebody say that they smell like cilantro. I'm like, that's fine. <laughs> that's great. Put some of them on your tacos. That's weird. They're all over the place, though. I see them in my bathroom, especially in the winter. Yeah, because they come inside to stay warm. Yeah, I feel bad but for them. But supposedly they swarm, the brown marmorated ones swarm. So they come inside your house, hang out, and then just cover your face. Ugh. And you fall down the stairs. And then the squirrels get you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's invasive species in a nutshell. Uh, what else we got here? You want to talk about a couple more of these? Yeah, I want to talk about my favorite of all time. Are you ready for this? Yes. The starling, the European starling. Yeah, and you know what? This is a great time to shout out uh, one of our new brother podcasts here on the network, uh, Omnibus, mm-hmm. with Ken Jennings of Jeopardy's fame. Sure. And John Roderick of the indie band Long Winters. Right. They have a new show called Omnibus that is about sort of obscure history, and uh, they did an entire episode on the European Starling. Oh, they did? Cool. Yeah. Well, then this ties into that. It does. So go listen to that show, subscribe, and here that is in a nutshell. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> back in 1890, there was this guy. He was a German immigrant to the U.S. His name was Eugene Schifflin. Did I pronounce it right? I think so. Eugene Schifflin was a Shakespeare enthusiast, right? To say, to say the least. He had this idea that it would be really cool. And remember, this is 1890. They had no idea about invasive species. No. At the very least, you wouldn't think a bird would be. But he decided that it, it would be really cool to release all of the birds mentioned by Shakespeare <laughs> into North America. So crazy. And he would start with the European starling. Yeah. So in winter of 1890, and then again, like a month or so later in 1891, he released a total of 100 European starlings in Central Park. That's 100. right. Make note of that number. 100 were released in 1890. And now there are more than 200 million European starlings in the United States, and they are jerk birds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they'll swarm like a, a brown marmorated stink bug. Mm-hmm. They'll swarm, but they swarm on cattle to scare them away from their food so mm-hmm. that the starlings can eat their food. So these birds are capable of scaring cattle off. Yeah. That's a big one. They'll also crash your plane. They will. They will, they will swarm your airplane. Uh, it has happened before. There was one that took off from Logan, uh, there in Boston, uh, worst bath, airport bathrooms in the world. And oh, yeah. It, yeah, it's pretty bad. Okay. I think I talked about the bathroom stalls there. There's like three inch gaps. In between the door. Oh, and the, yeah, yes. It's like literally you can just see each other pooping. You could fit like a whole Aunt Annie's through there. Yeah. <laughs> like you're going to eat that bagel? Just let me slide it through there. <laughs> right. Sideways. Well, well she, she makes pretzels, <laughs> delicious pretzels. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I wasn't saying she, she made bagels. I got you. I was just trying to think of something fatter than a pretzel. Could you fit a bagel through the stall? Is it really that bad? You could fit a bagel flat. Man. No. Like a bagel half? <laughs> No, it's not quite that bad, but it's bad. Okay. I like. I remember pooping at Logan and making eye contact with a dude. <laughs> Just <laughs> stained eye contact. Very distressing. Yeah. So uh, anyway, birds uh, crashed <laughs> crashed a plane into Boston Harbor, killed sixty two people. These starlings. Yeah. yeah, that's not good. And they are also very dense eaters, apparently. Right, like uh, like the carp. Yes, I believe so. They're definitely a huge problem, from what I understand. 
But they were the idea that they were released in appreciation of Shakespeare. I just find fascinating. I know. Thank you, and Eugene Shifflin. Now they're a major problem. Um, there's one other one we got to shout out too. Chuck is the cane toad. Oh yeah, which is another um, invasive species that was introduced using the Simpsons technique because there were some cane beetles that were harming Australia's sugar crop back in the 1930s. And so they got the idea to import some cane toads uh, to eat these beetles. And the cane toads, from what I understand, worked pretty well. But then their population boomed from, I think, 107 initial ones to, again, 200 million just in, in less than 100 years. Yeah, there's a great classic documentary on the cane toad. And we talked about them before in an episode, didn't we? Sure. Yeah. One of the ways Australia is delightfully weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll see you guys this fall. That's right. Your spring. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's true. They're all confused. <laughs> like, where are you, mate? Right. Although it's their summer. Well, no, it's their – September will be their spring. But now It'll it's be their our summer. Fall. Oh, right now? Yeah, it's the dead of summer for them. Man, I can't wait for can't wait to meet those people in person. So I know it's gonna be cool, man. I'm gonna get me a hat that has alligator teeth around the brim. <laughs> Make Australia as is, great again. As is local custom. <laughs> so Chuck, let's talk kudzu. You want to? Yeah, we'll finish up with kudzu. Um this is a great story called The True Story of Kudzu, comma, The Vine That Never Truly Ate the South by Bill Finch. Mm-hmm. And uh, everyone has probably heard of kudzu. It has a, a very steeped mythology. Um, and it's one of those things where people, um, especially outside of the South, mm. uh, talk about, oh, yeah, you got your cut. You know, kudzu is, is, is just everywhere you look, there's kudzu in the South. And, right. and if you go to any southern town, there will be a kudzu cafe. Yeah. <laughs> or a kudzu antique. There's a kudzu antiques right here in Decatur. Yep. It's just one of those things. The South took it and ran with it. Um, as far as just like a marketing thing. But here's the deal. Most people know it was introduced, uh, at the 1876 World's Fair Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. It was a, a vine from Asia. And, uh, the story goes that it just took over the South, but that's not quite right. Um, in 1935, there was uh, dust storms that damaged the prairies, and Congress said, you know what, uh, erosion is a big problem, so let's use kudzu. And they brought in 70 million seedlings to grow in nurseries as soil conservation. Right. Remember our episode on uh, desertification? I think we talked about that. Yeah. So they, like, were planting it on purpose. They were paying people uh, as much as $8 an acre which was pretty good money back then in the 1930s, sure. Yeah, to plant kudzu. Uh, flash forward a little bit, there was a radio host uh, for the Atlanta Constitution, um, one of our newspapers. Well, now it's the AJC. Mm-hmm. Back then, there were two newspapers, the Journal and the Constitution. And his name was a columnist named Channing Cope that became uh, an evangelist for this stuff. And basically, during these Depression-era radio broadcasts, would say, you know, plant kudzu uh, so the South can live again. Yeah, yeah, you know, to restore the soil back to its its original nature. Yeah, and so th- these farmers were taking money from the government, saying, "Okay, sure, I'll, I got some land that I'm not using or that could use some fixing, so I'll plant this stuff for eight bucks an acre." And they did, but the problem is, is no one could ever figure out how to make money off of it. It wasn't yeah. a crop. It wasn't good for grazing because apparently, when cattle and horses grazed on it, it died. Um, and no one really wanted to buy it from a nursery. So there's no way to make money off of it. So when the soil conservation payment program ended, everybody just kind of tilled it into the soil and kudzu went the way of the dinosaur or it would have had it not been for the railroad industry and the highway construction industry. Yeah. So the original goal was to plant about 8 million acres of the stuff around the South. Uh, but by 1945, there was just about a million acres planted. Uh, but because of, uh, the fact that cattle don't graze by the highway generally mm-hmm. or on the railroad, that's where it really took hold, uh, and did envelop things like roadside signs and full trees. And if you were, dr- and this is how it got their reputation because 
people would be on the train or they'd be driving down the highway and they would, that's where it was the worst and they would see it and it got this reputation as this monster vine that was eating the South. Yeah, because it really is disconcerting to see kudzu growing up like a 50 foot tree and totally covering it like it's consuming it. It's, it's very much, it evokes that same feeling, like seeing a snake eat like a whole, a whole rabbit, right? <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's, it evokes the same feeling. And, um, the, the thing is, is most Southerners from say like the fifties on when this was, when this really started to take root on these roadsides, their connection to the land was no longer in the for, the farms or the forest. It was in the cities and they traveled mostly in their car or on trains, which is where kudzu was most visible, remember? Yeah. So there was this idea and it was a pretty understandable idea that kudzu had taken over the South or was in the process of taking over the South. And the whole thing was helped along apparently by a garden club newsletter. Yeah. So the idea is that there were, uh, and this is a stat that you can, an incorrect stat that you can still get that says, you know, up to nine million acres of the, of the southern United States is covered in kudzu. <laughs> it all comes from these two books, a craft book and a culinary and healing guide are these two books that are most frequently quoted as to that number. The U.S. Forest Service says actually it's about 227,000 acres of forest land about the size of a small county in Georgia, nowhere near what they're saying it is. Uh, and while it's still, when you drive along some of these southern highways, it looks like it's eating a water tower, and it and it is. Um, once you step 10 feet into the forest, it stops. Yeah, because it's ter- it grows terribly in shade. Um, and, yeah, if you have a kudzu problem, just get some horses or cows, and there goes your kudzu problem. It's not a very hardy plant. It's just it has no no real predators or anything to hold it back on those roadsides or on those railroad embankments. Yeah. Which is why it grows so wild there. So those um those that culinary book and the um craft book that have to do with kudzu that seriously are the most widely cited sources by academic journals, That's by crazy. By scientists, by the government, everybody cites these, these sources. Um, and apparently they just made it up. But yeah. they said that it was, that it grows at a rate of 150,000 acres a year. And that same Forest Service report estimated it really grows at about 2,500 acres a year, which is entirely manage- manageable. So this, the, what's basically the poster child for invasive species in the United States, kudzu, is actually not really much of a problem at all. Yeah, so everybody, we we don't all drink Coca-Cola. Well, that's actually not true. Yeah, we all drink it. Actually, I don't really <laughs> drink it that much. But yeah, there is not a kudzu problem. Um, stop it. And stop saying Hotlanta. Yeah. Nobody here says that. <laughs> no, I remember that. That Again, in the 90s, there was a little push for that. Recycling, invasive species, and Hotlanta. <laughs> One of them didn't make it. <laughs> that's right. You got anything else? No, I thought this is a good one. I thought so, too. If you want to know more about invasive species, there's tons of them that we didn't even cover. Um, so go look them up. Educate yourself. And then go save the planet. And tell them Josh and Chuck sent you. Uh, and in the meantime, it's time for listener mail. I'm going to call this a uh, very sweet orchid story. Uh, a big hello to Josh, Chuck, and Jerry. I'm writing in to say how much I love your orchids episode and also share a bittersweet and pretty amazing thing that happened to my family. My grandmother was an avid gardener who had a knack for coaxing her collection of orchids into bloom again and again. Uh, I think some of her orchids might have been a decade or more old. When she was diagnosed with cancer, she passed along her orchids to my stepmother, who has continued the tradition. Uh, One particularly beautiful orchid had refused to bloom after the move until one day in August 2016 when it did bloom again. When my stepmother posted the picture to Facebook that morning, she didn't know that my grandmother was in the final process of passing away. Uh, someone used their smartphone to show the photo to my grandmother at hospice, and it was one of the very last things she saw. Must have brought her a lot of joy to know that her orchids, in fact, lived on. Uh, she attached a photo, very beautiful orchid. Uh, she said, orchids will always have a special place in my heart for sensing my grandmother's last day with us, and each of those plants is a treasured family heirloom. I hope I'll be the next to inherit the matrineal, matrilineal, 
matrilineal. I think so. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I hope I'll be the next to inherit the matrilineal green thumb. All the best, Maggie. That is a great, great orchid story. Yep, great listener mail. That's how you get on listener mail, everybody. Yep, you just warm our hearts. Okay? Or insult us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we don't actually read those. We just make grumbly references. To that's them. right. Uh, if you want us to make a grumbly reference to something you wrote, well, then write us an insulting email. If you want it to get read, then warm our hearts. You can tweet to us at SYSK Podcast or Josh Um Clark. I also have a website, by the way, called com. You can join Chuck on Facebook.com slash Charles W. Chuck Bryant. Uh, and you can also hit up the official Facebook page at Stuff You Should Know. And uh, what else, Chuck? Emails? Sure. Right? You can send us all an email, including Jerry, Noel, Matt, everybody, to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, stuffyoushouldknow.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. <laughs> <laughs>